Good morning and welcome. Any visitors, grateful to have you here worshiping with us at Southside Bible Church. We are studying through Paul's letter uh, to the Romans. And we have looked at his introduction in verses 1 through 7 for the last couple weeks and entitled it, A Man with a Message. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, form, Paul uh, gave us his gospel, God's gospel, he called it. And he's going to flush that out the rest of this letter. But first, Paul begins, I, I, as I start to flush out this gospel, I want you to, to know my heart toward you, church at Rome. The old saying, people don't really care how much you know until they know how much you care, is what Paul is doing. This next section, Paul will show how much he cares for the saints in Rome, and he'll share with them his affection for them, and how badly he wants to come there, and he wants to minister the gospel of God that he loves and treasures so much. Well, how does Paul express his love? Well, by sharing the gospel and telling this church more of God's truth. And so that is what we will take up this morning. And in my study this week, the Lord has encouraged my heart greatly to, to get inside of Paul's heart and see what made him tick. To see what this gospel did, uh, Paul truly was a doulos of Christ. He was a bondservant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And my prayer all week is that for my own heart and for yours is I want everyone in this room to be a doulos of Christ. If the gospel has grown cold in your heart, maybe it's the best kept secret that you have. Your burdens and your needs are the sovereign of your life. That's what gets all of your focus and all of your preoccupation. The gospel may have become second or third priority in your life. May this passage give wings to your heart and revive it and awaken you from your slumber even this morning. As, as Sean prayed that we would unite our hearts in the unity of proclaiming this gospel to every sphere possible until we're taken to glory. That's what a doulos does. Cold hearts and distracted hearts will never have the fruit of what we will look at this morning. This is not just to be Paul's heart, the apostle, but this is the heart of everyone who's ever tasted of the free grace of God. And so what I would pray for all of us then this morning is that we would know to, to a certain degree what Paul had in his heart uh, for the lost. And may God grant that to every heart this morning. So let's go to the only one who can do that. Father, we come to you and we're a needy people. God, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. And so as we look at, at the, the beauties of the heart that you put in Paul, God, his heart for the lost I pray that you would revive and stir that in every heart in this room. God, we need to be due losses of Christ and to the advancement of the name of Jesus Christ. And so God, awaken us to this very thing. Don't let it be cold. Don't let it be distant. Let it be the forefront of all that we are, say, think, and do. And so God, would you do that? Would you do that in every heart? Here this morning, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, let's take a look then together at Paul's heart, uh, the, the apostle with a burning heart for Rome. And, and again, this is a church he's never visited. I just want you to keep that in mind even as we look this morning. At the end of this book, he knew about 24 people personally that he's probably met through the journey, but he has never been to this church and does not know the majority of it, we can assume. So our outline for this morning is we're going to look at four aspects then of what motivated the messenger. In verse 8, he was a delighted messenger. In verses 9 through 13, he was a desirous messenger. And in verse 14, he was a debted messenger. And in verse 15, he was a very determined messenger. So let's take this first point of this motivated messenger. Paul was a delighted messenger in verse 8. Romans chapter 1, verse 8. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Paul is delighted in thanking God for these believers in Rome. And I like the Greek word that he uses for thanks, eucharisto. It means to give thanks, and it's, it's what was used when we're going to do at the end of the service when Christ took the bread, which is called the Eucharist, and he breaks it and he gives thanks to God. 
And so Paul is Eucharistoing, uh, just thanking God for the saints in Rome, and it's a present tense verb. This isn't, he did it one time. This is a characteristic of Paul's heart. I just keep giving thanks to God for you who are at Rome, for you all. Paul loved and he, he cared about persons, not just the, the object of faith, but faith in people, faith growing and maturing and deepening in souls. And so Paul had a heart for people and he's rejoicing in what God is doing in these people. A good example, I believe, for all of us to, to go and say, I thank God for you. We, we need, I, I've said this many times from the pulpit, is I think we need to be a more expressive people to, to come and, and in our relationships with one another and to share our hearts and what we feel about each other and not just wait till we die and stand up here and tell everybody what they meant to you. And so Paul was very good to just say, my heart is large for you. I give thanks for you. And so I want us to, to grow in the way you share with your wife and the way you share with your children and your, your friends and, and just the, the gospel makes you want to express love with your mouth, actions, and deeds. Don't just be Stoics. Just this truth in Paul's heart, he, he just had to express it to others and to people. And I pray that we will grow from our worship to, to all areas to, to be expressive of what we mean to one another and our affection for each other. Well, my question is, why is Paul so thankful? Uh, continuously giving thanks to God, he says, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. Well, wait a minute, Paul. I, th I thought faith was kind of an internal thing. <clears throat> Later, you're going to write that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. And so faith is invisible but to God, God sees the heart and he looks at the heart that believes. So how do people know? How do they see this? Well, in verse five, Paul says, I'm laboring to bring about the obedience of faith. And when faith begins to live and work out what it believes, people look at it and they give glory to God because of your faith. They know that what's producing this is not humanity. It's not flesh begetting flesh. It's faith that's being manifested and changing and transforming you. So I thank my God continuously because your, your faith is being proclaimed throughout the world. They're talking about what this gospel has done in the church of Rome. Because of what your faith is, the whole world knew about it. I hear so often about your faith. I am an encouraged minister. I go into hospitals and they, they testify of you who have been there and your faith and those who are sick and dying and go into nursing homes and thank you that you guys come and bring the gospel week after week. And I, I've met visitors who said, man, you're one of the people from your church or in my office and I had to come see what this is all about. I, I hear it from neighbors and churches are hearing about your love as far as Kenya, North Africa. I go on campuses. DU still talks about your faith. The men and women who go around on Saturday mornings and, and just hearing it and, 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 and Brendan McMillan preaching the gospel week in and week out. Paul just says, wherever I travel, I, I hear about your faith and what God is doing. And that is what faith should do. The obedience of faith. It, it should be something that's so transformative that as people look in, it's blowing them away and they're talking about your faith. In Rome, Rome was the center of idol worship and debauchery. It's the Las Vegas on steroids. Your faith in the midst of Rome is being proclaimed everywhere. Christ is being believed and trusted in Rome. There's no CNN, Fox, NBC, papers, or internet. Just word of mouth spreading and talking about your faith in Rome. It's observable. It's noticeable. It's public. The obedience of your faith is being proclaimed. And I just keep thanking God because of it. I, I love it. I love when I see the outworking of faith in lives, says the Apostle Paul. And why? We saw in verse 5, because the name of Christ is being glorified as a saving God who's transforming lives and changing them. So I love the obedience of faith because it can only be to God be the glory. Christ is being exalted by your lives. That's why God has put faith in us. It's not to hide it under a bushel, but to let it shine 
We're not to be invisible Christians or secret disciples. Listen to Paul in Romans 15 and a little ch- couple chapters later. We'll, we'll get there. Concerning you, my brethren, I myself also am convinced that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to admonish one another and, and teach each other in the word of God and counsel. You're, you're overflowing with goodness. Uh, I, I rejoice in the saints at Rome. Goodness is overflowing out of your lives. That's what faith does. And then in chapter 16, verse 19, he says, The report of your obedience has reached to all. Therefore, I'm rejoicing over you, but I want you to be wise in what is good and innocent in what is evil. Paul rejoices where true faith is found, where it's being manifested. Doesn't that just thrill your heart? Paul sees the spread of God's great mercy in Christ. He he knows the promise, being being in Judaism, that God says, Abraham, through your seed, singular, the nations are going to be blessed. And Paul's rejoicing because the nations are being blessed. This gospel is doing exactly what God said would happen when Christ was raised from the dead. Paul's rejoicing. God is doing what he said. I'm so happy what God's doing in Rome. You just love this stuff. It has to be what makes your heart tick. The spread of the glory of God, people calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart is so thrilled at these things, says Paul. And I just, I I had some of the sweetest community groups this week where God met us. He's, He's moving, He's doing miraculous things. Faith, the obedience of faith is just springing up. Uh, In counseling, I just saw some mighty people who have been in bondage for decades and God setting them free in the gospel. It's what what I've been praying for. And I just thank my God for you constantly that your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. I, I pray that that's what thrills your soul. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Well, what about verses two through four of this gospel has not awakened your heart to want to just see the spread of it uh, in in hearts and in obedience of faith. This gospel is so beautiful. We're going to see what it should do in a life. And I, I want you to do surgery on your own life today, please. Don't just sit and listen to a sermon. This is our own worship to God. And what this did in my heart, I'm asking every heart that would do that this morning. Father, I pray that you would do that in our midst. God, I want deaded messengers from Southside Bible Church. And so, Lord, what we see in Paul's heart already, I pray that you would stir that in each and every heart here this morning. Amen. Our second point, Paul was a desirous messenger. If you'll look with me in verse 9, for God, whom I serve in my spirit, And the preaching of the gospel of his son. So he said it was God's gospel. It's my gospel, what he got from them. But it's the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. It is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you. Always in my prayer, making request, if perhaps now at last by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I've planned to come to you and have been prevented thus so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. (coughs) Paul is very desirous then of coming to the saints in Rome. I've, I've desired it. Paul calls God, listen to this, he calls God to witness to his heart and his praying for them. So do I care about you, saints at Rome? My guess is there's some kind of doubt going on. They heard Paul was going to come. He's never showed up. And does he really care? Is he just kind of saying it, but doesn't care? Do I care? I love his answer. Ask God. Go ask God. How unceasingly I have brought you to his throne and prayed for you. You want to know my heart? Go ask God. The main prayer request that he keeps asking, I want to be with you. Your faith is my joy and praise. I want to visit you. In verse 10, always in my prayers, making mention of you. And I'm just praying that I can come and I have been hindered thus far. So I'm attached to you, Rome, because of the gospel of Jesus. 
And I'm, I'm in the secret place for you constantly. I have a genuine interest in your souls and for the advancement of the kingdom of God, and I want to see you. How dedicated Paul was to the saints of God. And what that did for me this week is it begs the question of my own heart, do I share the same burden of Paul? And, and even tougher, what I had to wrestle with. Would God bear witness to it? Could I say, go to the throne room of God and ask Him how much I love you and how much I come to the throne of grace for you? Do you genuinely pray for the saints of God at Southside Bible Church and beyond? Would God be a witness to your joy in the growing faith, obedience of the faith in other people? Why is Paul so desperately praying for these saints that he might come to them? Why was it such a burden? In verse 11, he says, I long to see you so that I can impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. And here it is, this word long, it means to desire or to yearn. And it's in the present tense again. I just have this continual desire and yearning for you. Why, Paul? You've never met him. Why? Well, there's a seed of faith and, and, and Paul wants to see it grow up into an oak. You, you, you want to use any gift that you have. And Paul had mighty gifts. And he wants to come use them in Rome for the establishing and the building up of this church that has genuine, true faith. I just want to come, he says, that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established. Paul didn't, did not want to go to Rome and see the Colosseum. Pantheon or the Senate or the Emperor, all the glory of Rome. Paul, I just want to see the saints in Rome. That's what attracts me. That's why I want to come to Rome. I just want to come to you beautiful Christians in Rome, and I want you to be established. That Greek word means to make firm or, or to set up, and it's in an aorist tense, kind of like a little snapshot. I want to come and just see you established in this gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I think the gift appears, the, the gift that he wants to impart is the teaching of this gospel. I want to come and, and teach it day and night and keep showing you the glories and the beauties and the intricacies that God has given to me. And so I want to come, Rome, and bring the truth of this gospel to you. I want to increase your understanding and confidence in Christ in this gospel. I want to stir up your affection to the God of all Grace, I, I want you to realize everything is of this grace. Your growth in practical obedience that faith produces, I want to come and establish it. I want the obedience <coughs> of the faith. Titus, when he wrote, he said, I write for the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth that accords with holiness, the truth that produces the obedience of faith. I want to take what God has given to me and I want to pour it into your lives, says Paul. My service to you is a relentless thanking and praying that I might come to you and establish you in the obedience of faith for his name's sake. But Paul goes one step further to clarify and expand. It's not one-sided. It's not one-sided. <clears throat> I'm not the only one that has something to offer, Paul says. I want to, with you, I want mutual encouragement I'm coming for the community. I, I want your faith and my faith, uh, faith begetting faith. I want to come and share what God's revealed and testify of my faith. And I want to hear of yours. And I, I want to be like iron sharpening iron. I, I, I want to meet with young faith. I want to meet with old faith, the saints who have journeyed and just won't let go of Jesus in their 70s and 80s and even 90s. I, I, want, to, I want to meet new faith. It is so invigorating to me to hang with a new believer who just the grass is greener and the sky is bluer. I like meeting with struggling faith, with tested faith. This is my joy, Paul says, is being strengthened by each other's faith. Here's what gives life to community, our faith. And we, get, we gather, and it's not just talk about willy-nilly, but I want my faith strengthened mine. I want to give you my gifts. You give me your gifts. We want to gather to strengthen each other's faith. My, it is beautiful to watch this in the journey here uh, at Southside. My, my heart is overwhelmed. And so I just, do you know anything about this? I just, you just need to answer that with honesty, judgment, judgment day honesty. 
I want to establish people in their faith so that God will get the glory in verse 5. I want my children to take deliberate, I want to have deliberate steps to establish them in a faith to follow after Christ. And I'm going to be diligent. I just don't want moral little children. I'm going to be diligent in this gospel to point, show, and pray. I want uh, my, my wife, I want you husbands, your wives, how might I establish them? In the Word of God, I, I, I want this to be our passions. Your wives, your husbands, how do I use these gifts that God's given me to help establish Him in the faith? Singles, to redeem your high calling and to establish you in the faith and what God's called you to do. And again, it's the highest calling. Treasure that calling. It's not a curse. To establish each other in this. The, the gospel makes you alive to this. I just want to help establish people in their faith. And then in verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I've planned to come to you and have been prevented thus so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. So Paul's going to drive it even harder. I, I've planned to come, but I've been stopped. I've been hindered. The fact that I have not come to Rome yet is not a lack of desire, just opportunity. I want to come, but I want to come, he says, to obtain some fruit among you. I, I want more converts in Rome. I want to get the full harvest, all of God's elect in Rome. And I want to deepen you in the gospel and therefore in its proclamation. I want, here, here's a simple phrase, I want more faith and deeper faith is what drove, drove Paul. There, there's your, your mission in a nutshell. I want more faith. I want to give my life to see more faith. People get saved, and I want to give my life to deepen faith. I, you, you get in this gospel, and every day I want you to fill up in Christ and take one step with your left leg and say, I want more faith, and my right leg, I want to deepen faith. I exist for one thing all day long. I want to see new faith, and I want to deepen faith. That's the passion. That's why I exist. That's why I'm alive. That's why I go to work. That's what I do with my children. I just want you to see that is the heart of this whole thing. This is so different then than just I come to church and get what I can get and people didn't minister to me at that church. I'm leaving. That can never be it. And I'm praying for revival in every one of our hearts. Paul, I come to share and give and partake in mutual ministry. Are you interested in being more than a receiver in the body of Christ? Until you are, the gospel will be dormant in your life. It will be winter in your soul. And so I want this gospel to make you alive. To, I want to see faith in others and I want to see it established in those who know him. And that, that's my focus. Put me wherever you want, God. That's, that's what I exist for, for your name's sake. Paul was a delighted messenger. He's giving thanks. He's a very desirous messenger. He wants to come. But my third point is Paul was an indebted messenger in verse 14. I'm under obligation, both to Greeks and to barbarians and both to the wise and to the foolish. I'm under obligation. The Greek word literally means a debtor. I'm a debtor. So Paul, what is the debt? What does Paul have to pay the Greeks and the barbarians? And he answers it in verse 15, to preach the gospel. <laughs> so I'm a debtor to preach the gospel. Well, my question is, how do you get into such debt? Because I, I want to get Paul's heart. How do you get? He said, I, I'm called as an apostle. He said, I've been set apart for the gospel of God. I'm a doulos. And Jesus is Lord in the Great Commission. He said, go and make disciples. And so Paul's obligated, right? just doesn't feel like the flavor of the passage though. In verse 5 he says, as we have received grace. Paul is stunned that he received grace and salvation and apostleship to do this calling. So how does this create debtors? How does the grace of God being poured out upon a man, woman, or child make us debtors? Are we debtors as well? Or is just Paul the only one who's a debtor? Well, verse 14, I want you to catch it one more time. 
I am under obligation, a debtor, both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. It's a real simple observation. Paul is a debtor to who? To people. Paul is not a debtor saying to God. So I'm a debtor to people. And so how do you get into debt with people? And in our day and age, we're, we're experts at it by borrowing and mortgages. And we, we don't need any help how to get in debt with people. But the, the barbarians and the Greeks didn't loan Paul anything. So why is he in debt to these people he's never met? They haven't lent him money. Well, the situation is in verse 5, Paul has received something freely from God. This gospel is a free gift. It's all of God's doing. Paul received grace. So you don't become a debtor to God when he gives you grace. Grace does not make you a debtor. You don't spend the rest of your life trying to pay back the debt. Oh, every day I just want to pay back the debt. I'm just going to keep paying at what God paid to set me free. In Matthew 18, he tells a parable of someone who owed 10,000 talents. And he comes before the one he owed, and he, and he lies. 10,000 talents was more than the gross national debt of that city, that town. It would have taken him forever. He could have never paid it back in, in 20 lives. And so he says, I will pay it back. I'll pay it back. The guy didn't get grace. And how do we know it? If someone owed him two denarii, just a little bit, and he runs out and he chokes him and throws the guy in jail. And Jesus is saying, you who won't forgive, uh, you're going you're to be cast into the outer darkness where the worm never dies. And so if you don't get grace, you're, you're, gonna, you're never going to live into the fullness of the gospel. This whole book of Romans is that you would understand grace. And so our very first step is it's not to pay back. When, when you are given a gift, you don't, at Christmas, you don't spend the rest of your life trying to pay back your wife. You know, every month I'll, I'll pay back till I pay off the gift that you gave me. That is not what is going on in this passage. Grace is not a mortgage. You don't go into debt with God. Your debt has been paid in full, and it's been completely forgiven. John Piper, who helped me understand this point better than any commentator, he said, grace pays debt, it doesn't incur them. And so your debt has been completely paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. And if you see it as a debt to pay back, you nullify grace and you will never be a debtor to others. You'll you'll always live trying to pay this debt back. you'll, You'll never be what God intends you to be if that's your mindset this morning. So Paul is not a debtor to God, but he is to barbarians and Greeks and the wise and the foolish. Paul was a debtor to those who needed the grace that he needed. Paul is on his way to kill anyone who names the name of Jesus Christ. And God zaps him on the road to Damascus. And so he, here it is. I did not deserve grace. I killed anyone who named his name. If there was anyone who didn't deserve grace, Paul said, I'm the poster child. And now I'm a debtor to everyone who is graceless. To everyone who hasn't received this grace that I have received, that I was given by God, I'm just a debtor. Every person I walk by who hasn't received grace, I'm now a debtor. And I, I'm not good at coming up with new illustrations, and when I get one that I like, I just I drive it in the ground. So here it is. You've heard it. There might be four people here who never have. So smile and love them. But I want you to picture a 100-story building and there's a fire in the middle, and it's coming up, and you're all on the 100th floor. And this fire is coming, and it is going to consume everyone. There's a, there's a hundred of you just standing up there. There's no way out. It's a sure death. And someone taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, there's a fire escape down the back. And if you go hit that, you can, go, you can come right down. And if you slide down this fire escape, and you get off, and you just walk out, thank you, Jesus. And you just walk away. And you go back home to tell your family about how God delivered you and how great it was and the beautiful salvation that came. Something's wrong. That there's 99 people who are standing on the building that you are standing on and you will not tell them the way of rescue. You're a debtor to tell those 99 how to escape the fire. That's certain death that's coming upon them. If you know grace, you were called and there was nothing in you that merited God's calling and favor to be upon you. 
It was free and it was sovereign grace. And that's not so you can go and scalp Arminians with all the truth that you've learned about election. But that's so that you would never ever quit being overwhelmed that God chose you and, and came and called you and opened your eyes and showed you Christ. I did not deserve this. I deserve the opposite. But he gave me grace. I ran with 30 guys in first grade at Our Lady of Fatima. I'll never forget that grade school. And we were bad boys. Right, Mom? My mom thought I was good, but I, I wasn't, Mom. I was a bad, bad boy. And God called me out. And many of them are still running around in bars and drunk and immorality and adultery. And I had a, a friend that was in that group and she was driving in Arizona on a golf cart and she got drunk and fell out of the cart and hit her head and just died. And we all gathered together the night before the funeral at a bar and I went and I just sat there just, I was a debtor to every soul sitting in that place that I grew up with. And God had pulled me out and called me out and they were trying to deal with death and they had no hope and they had no way and just all I could do was just spout off to every and any one of them. Just a debtor. And I, I pray that every one of us, this is what I'm asking, that every one of us this morning would feel the debt of free sovereign grace. You're going to walk out of here and you can't lay, lay eyes on a, another human being, whether cultured or uncultured, and say they don't qualify because you didn't qualify. They are no less deserving than you were. And that's got to take over your heart, this gospel. And that's why Paul says the Greeks and barbarians, the Greeks were the paradigm of culture. They were sophisticated. They were advanced. They were the yuppies. And the barbarians were less cultured, uncivilized, and they were foreigners. And so it really doesn't matter whether you're wise or educated, foolish, uneducated, higher class, no class. Paul just says, I am now a debtor to everyone who has not received the grace of God. This grace has taken me over, it owns me, and I have to be a debtor to everyone to tell them of the glory of grace. There's no qualifications for grace, it's free. Thus debtors to everyone who stands in need of the same grace that I drink up daily. Paul knew he didn't qualify. Listen to what he said in Timothy. It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world for what? To save sinners among who I am foremost of all. I'm the chief. And yet for this reason, I found mercy in order that as me, as the foremost of sinners, Jesus Christ might demonstrate his perfect patience as an example for those who would believe in him for eternal life. Anyone who says, man, I could never be saved. Paul says, I get to be the poster child of the patience of God because I should have never got saved. He should have thrown me in hell. If you think you've done something too bad, try killing every Christian you get your hands on. Look at the grace of God this morning. The only reason I was qualified, Paul says, was because I was so unqualified and God wanted to magnify his free grace. And now I can't keep this from other people. So God grip us with the reality of free sovereign grace so that there is no racism in any heart in this room. There's no homophobics. I pray for no self-righteousness. That no man or woman we could walk by because we don't like them. That we would be people who are debtor to all of mankind. Until I breathe my last, this debt cannot be paid. And, and, and so... You don't retire from this debt and go collect seashells till you die. I want you to get that out of your mind right now. I'm a debtor to this gospel until I breathe my last. And I don't retire from it. And I pray that every one of us would unite on this glorious truth. And our last point in verse 15 is Paul was a determined messenger. He said, so for my part, then I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Paul, listen to this. Paul was not just indebted, and I, I want to make sure we close with this. <coughs> he was eager. This wasn't a guy. Have you ever met the people who you're so indebted? Every day you get up and you groan. It's hard to get out of bed because you got so much debt. 
It's miserable. That's not the debt that we're carrying around. Oh, I got to go share the gospel. It's a glad indebtedness. This is glorious. I can pay this debt daily by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Anyone want to pay off your debts? (laughs) We should have classes on this kind of debt management, huh? You want a class on this kind of debt management? Go pay your debts. Share Jesus with anyone and everyone. We all owe it. Every one of us, from the least to the greatest. We just have this beautiful gospel that's abounding in riches, Paul says, to all who call upon his name will be saved. To be quiet would be criminal. The great preacher Robert Murray McShane said he wrote a letter to a young man that was struggling. And he said this to the young man. I had many friends when I was a younger man, but I had no friend who cared for my soul. I had many friends, but not one of them cared for my soul to tell me the truth of the gospel. The greatest kindness that we can show to anyone is to commend the greatest kindness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to their ears. I had a young man in the church who told me, he said, I'm just done with wasting my life. All I want to do now is tell this gospel to anyone and everyone. This crazy kid was in L.A. in an airport and there was a piano and he just started playing it and people thought he was some, like, a, like a famous singer, which he isn't. And they started gathering around and asking questions and he started singing Christian songs and preaching the gospel in the L.A. airport. That's why Paul's so eager to preach the gospel in Rome. Thus, faith is being proclaimed. I want you to be established in that faith. And I want to be encouraged by your faith. And I'm a debtor to tell all men about this gospel, so I'm eager. And I meet people who are eager to watch a Super Bowl, eager to eat at every perfect restaurant in Denver, eager to shop, eager to play a sport, eager to be the top of their class. But I I want you to hear the heart of a child of God is how many are eager to preach the gospel. How many are eager? You're just a shaken up can of pop, man. You open it up and it's what comes out of you. Only people who get this gospel of verses 2 through 4 are eager. It's got to overtake your heart to where it's all you want to talk about. I don't have to force it. This is just what has me. Make every effort, make every heart to be a debtor who does not know this grace. And so that my prayer is that God would awaken everyone in this room to this reality and that it would have a greater hold uh, in each believing heart. And if you've come and, and you are a debtor to God and you're trying to pay the debt off by being a good person and coming to church and clean up your life, it's, it's an infinite debt that you'll never be able to pay. It just, it can't be paid by a human. So Jesus Christ went up on a cross and bore the wrath of God for our sins. He paid the debt. And all he's asking is that by faith, you'll turn from your sin and you'll believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did. It's the only way to get out of debt with God. Look to the cross of Christ. And for those who have, let's go tell everyone that we can about the cross. Let's, let's join forces and gifts and all that we are And just don't lose sight. You don't just work in a nursery. You go into a nursery so people can be established in the faith without their kids disrupting them. And and so I I just want you to get the vision. Everything that we do is is how do we advance people knowing Christ and being established in Christ to make it to the very end. So we're going to close out a couple thoughts of application and then we're going to go to the communion table uh, to, to remember how our debt was paid. And it's so beautiful. So how can we work on being motivated messengers? First, I, 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 your relationship to God. Paul says, I thank my God. I thank my God. And this seems so simple. But I pray that you could say with the psalmist this morning, Oh God, you are my God. Do you remember when we be- began this epistle and Wesley's going around the world preaching the gospel and he gets saved? And he finally said, Even my sins have been forgiven. I pray that everyone in this room can say, oh God, you're, you're my God through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let religion, don't let 20 years of church attendance keep you from God. This is a gospel that brings you to God and you can say, oh God, you're my 
God. I had this, I told you about this guy a long time ago. I went to see you and I, I preached a, a Bible study and this kid jumps up afterwards and rips open his shirt <laughs> and on his chest is the Great Commission tattooed in Greek. That's a lot of letters on one chest. And, I, and, and he said, I, I spent two years here at CU. Just anyone who walked by me, I told them the gospel and if I missed them, I got down and repented and asked God's forgiveness. Then I got saved. And the grace of God has so overwhelmed my heart that now I share because he loves me and I don't have to do this as a wrong kind of debtor, but now a true debtor to grace that paid every bit of my debt. And so every morning when I get up, I like to see in the mirror the great commission of, of how I want to live now for the one who died and lived for me. I call that a relationship to God. Secondly, Paul's a man of prayer. He's praying for them unceasingly, constantly, continually. Prayer is the foundation and starting point of all ministry. If anyone will ever have faith or grow in their faith, it will come through prayer. It will come through us beseeching our God. Paul writes to the Thessalonians, To this end also we pray for you always, that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith with power, in order that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The depth of intensity of prayer measures the depth of intensity of our concern. And so we were praying for all the people that we're ministering to. And when you hear about each other's friends and family, we're praying and we're interceding and we're praying for each other that we would be established in the faith. And thirdly, he's a thankful man. We're so thankful when we see God at work. And when you get that everything is of grace to unworthy, undeserving sinners, you should be the most grateful people who have ever lived with the grace of God and what he's given us. And then you're submissive to God. Paul says, I wanted to come to you by the will of God. Paul wanted to go to Rome and he prayed again and again and he said, I've been hindered thus far. <clears throat> and, and it's so easy to get frustrated when you get hindered, when your ministry plans are not God's and your ministry plans are not his timing. And so easy to get frustrated. And, and, and I just want you to hear this. Because of the delay of God, we have the book of Romans. <laughs> That's a great gift. I'm glad God didn't let him go when he wanted to go or we wouldn't have Romans. And so some of you might be wished he had gone so you don't have to spend six years with me in Romans, but it's, it's cool. So how God answered it, how did he answer it? <laughs> he, he brought Paul into Rome as a prisoner. <laughs> what a way to answer your prayer, Paul. <laughs> Here you go. You want to go to Rome? I'm going to take you there as a prisoner. And in Philippians 1, Paul says the whole praetorium guard is hearing the gospel and believing in Jesus Christ. I'm a debtor. Stick me in prison in Rome and I'll just start telling everyone about Jesus Christ. So he said, be happy. The, the gospel's not changed. It's going forth right in their home, right in the middle of, of, the, of the whole Roman setup. And so I want you to pray anyway, anyhow, anytime, God, how you want to use me for creating faith to be that instrument of salvation and then for others to grow and be built up. I have a dear brother who's very, very sick and he came to a crossroad where he had to decide to do dialysis or just die. And he, he just said, man, I have so much assurance. I just, I'm ready to die. I, I, I'm so sick. I just got to sit in my house. I can't do anything. And um, we met and he's been in that house as a house just praying and interceding for so many of you. And every prayer request I have, anytime I get to share the gospel, I'm just telling him about who people are and he just prays and prays. I think some of you are converted here because of his prayers and some of you have grown because of his prayers. And when he realized that God's using him that way, he said, I'll, I'll get dialysis. If I just got to sit in my house sick and can pray for these things, man, I'll do it. And I'm just, that is submissive to God. Fifthly, a personal concern for the saints. Again, Paul had never visited Rome and he was concerned. Do we have this kind of concern for the people that we've never met? Those who are being martyred even this morning around the world who have faith in Christ. So we, we want to have, you know, some of you haven't even met sitting here this morning 
and we care about each other because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And then do you desire, sixthly, their strengthening that they would be established? Our whole church was built on Colossians 1.28. We proclaim him, Christ, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose, I also labor to the point of fatigue, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. Does your heart just beat to see God's people strengthened in their faith and built up and established? I just want to be a channel of grace to make you stronger. I pray that you are discipling people, you're getting in lives, you're doing everything you possibly can to help build people up and establish them in the faith. And then I pray that your personal conviction of your obligation to the gospel, I I pray that you would see that you're a debtor and that that would consume you more than your own needs and all the things that you think about throughout the day, but that our hearts would be taken over with this gospel. And all I want to do is advance it. I want to see faith created and I want to see faith deepened. I want revival in the highways and byways. And so I, I'm excited. I, I got a, uh, an opportunity for service at a new nursing home to have a service there. We need musician, musicians and preachers. Uh, I want you to see Rick Hallahan um, and go find opportunities. Just as debtors, as what, what we need is organic, not planned, and just organic, true testifying of the grace that you've tasted and seen. And just open your eyes, and, and we're, a, we're a team. We're one laboring for the spread of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So what we're going to do is we're going to come to the table and we're going to look at what makes us debtors. If you're sitting here going, I don't feel any, anything for the lost. I really don't care. Is where, where it starts is you come back to the cross, uh, the power of the cross. And you look again at what Christ has done to pay our debt. And if that doesn't somehow begin to make you indebted to tell others of this gospel, something's wrong. So let me pray and then we will uh, pass out the elements And I just want to remind you as we pass out the elements that this is for believers only. If you're an unbeliever, I'd ask that you don't partake uh, because God asks that you don't partake, but that you would come to faith and believe in Christ. And we'd love to help you in that after the service. And then that you would exercise oversight in your families for which children should or shouldn't take of communion. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for Paul and what you did in his heart and how through the Spirit you gave us this letter Thank you that he was delayed and so that he, by your spirit, penned the book of Romans that has changed the world for thousands of years. And so, God, I would just pray that it would change us today. I pray that Southside Bible Church would lay hold of the beauties of the cross of Christ. I pray that you would enlighten and deepen our thoughts and our hearts and our love and affection for the work of Christ. And I pray the fruit of that would be hearts that want everyone and anyone to come under this Christ, to find the saving grace that is offered freely in him. God, I pray, let us, let us be true debtors and, and take away any prejudice or laziness or anything that would ever be in our way to tell of the glories and the beauties of Christ. God, thank you. Thank you for uh, making us motivated messengers. And so, God, I pray that you will work in our midst and you'll use each one of our gifts to, to bring this about. And so, God, let faith be called in, in in South Denver and the whole world and let us be established in the faith at Southside Bible. Let us use our gifts and our hearts and desires for this end, for the one purpose, that much would be made of Jesus Christ and he would be glorified. God, I pray now at the communion table that every heart would be encouraged now as they remember the greatest gift that has ever been given. God, let us eat and drink worthily with eyes of faith, wanting to leave any sin in our lives and wanting to walk closer with him. I pray that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.